Hey, there's Nicole. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? And there's a go. Oh, hi. Go. Is, Hello. Uh, hi, nice to meet you, uh, Nicole. Is, is, it supposed to be on, is it supposed to be on reverse screen or? Um, can well, I, it's why it, it, oh, wait, when, when you're, when you turn your, um, your camera around, you just yeah, automatically go. go on reverse screen. Oh, there we are. Isn't this, uh, this beautiful? We're, we're all figuring out, we're all figuring <laughs> out Instagram live. That's how this all works. Yeah. Uh, so, this is it's always not, entertaining. Well, this is, is. Not, not seeing you. So um, let me make sure the volume's up. So if you ask me questions, I can. Oh, I'm yeah. all the way up. So, all right, just tell me what to do, buddy. Isn't, isn't yeah, we can great? hear you well. <laughs> isn't this great? It's like, um, I, I think of this as like the, the old, 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 old days of television, like where it all started, you know, like, like or, or radio, you know, I mean, we're kind of like Alexander Graham Bell here, you know, trying to figure out how to talk on the phone, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's what's kind of cool about all this, I think. Anyways, I know, or um, like hitting the TV to get it to work. Um, yeah, exactly. Right. The rabbit right. ears. Hold, holding <laughs> the rabbit ears and everything. That's essentially what we're doing. This is the 2021 version of that. And speaking of rabbit ears, um, Nicole, because of your fan behind your head, it looks like you have <laughs> rabbit ears. <laughs> so this is, this is, this yeah, is there weird. You but it's also weird for me because I'm used to teaching Zoom where I'm seeing the audience now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'll, I'll field the questions as best as I can. Yeah. And that, hey, that's all you can do, right? Well, but, you know, we're used to see, reading bodies and gestures. So when you Paul's like, hey, let's go. What are you doing? You know, I can, I can, <laughs> right. That right. was but, a good I, a good Paul impersonation. Yeah, that was a good Paul impersonation. Oh, my impersonation. God. I have, I, have, I have so many Paul impersonations. You don't even know. But, <laughs> I don't know if I want to see this. Andrea asked me to go first, so I'm not hogging the thing here. Okay. No. So um, just for those people who are joining in, a lot of you people know already, this is Hagop Nigerian. And um, so after we get done talking to Hago, we're going to be, we get a two for one today. So we're going to be talking to Andrea uh, Bergseg, uh, Bersegliari. <laughs> Don't say the G. Don't say the G. Bersegliari. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So I screwed that up. Um, but we're going to be speaking to Andrea right after we speak to Hago. We're fortunate we get a two for one. They share the same studio space. So, no, um, same house, you, two studios. But aren't you under the same roof, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, it's a okay, different okay. wing. So it's I a different wing. wing. It's that wing over there. <laughs> All right. All right. Whatever. Come on. Let's well, no, there. because it's most couples don't want to be in the same space. So we built separate <laughs> spaces, right? I mean. Yeah. But, but it is under the same roof. So therefore, you can say that you share a space. <laughs> All right. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> Semantic. Whatever. So, so it, thank you, Nicole. It's semantic. <laughs> but Hagop, so great to see you today. I've been a, um, a fan of Hagop's work for a long time. Um, we go back. Um, I remember meeting Hagop, I think, in 1996. Yeah. When um, I was teaching it, I just started teaching it at Cypress College. And everybody that was there said, Paul, you've got to meet this guy, Hagop. He's teaching, um, I think you were teaching life drawing at the time. Yeah, I was at Cal State doing figure drawing and painting, sure. Yeah, and they go, you, you've you got to meet Hago. He's really great. You should see this guy. He rides a skateboard. Um, he he plays accordion in his classes <laughs> to his students. And I'm like, oh, really? You know, like, so anyway, that was my first introduction to him. And then after that, I found out that we had all kinds of things in common, including, like, a lot of the music that we were interested in. Right. But, yeah. um, and also... Um, I studied with uh, my painting professor as an undergraduate, studied at, at Tyler, um, and so and in Philadelphia. And we're, that's Hago, where Hagop went to graduate school, is that correct? Correct, right, yes. And so there were a lot of, um, I think a lot of common ground um, when we were talking about some of the artists. I yeah. don't think a lot of West Coast artists would have known them, but I just happened to because I studied yeah. with somebody from Tyler, and so did Hagop, so. Well, and I have to big, give the big shout out to Stanley Whitney, who I mentioned that you knew, that's 96, yeah. but 
just recently he's gone over the top as much deserved with his fame. So yeah, like Stanley was one of those names you could say, and Paul knew it. But yeah, Tyler, and then we fell into the whole teaching thing, right? And then you were there, yeah. and I taught part time at Cypress, and then yeah. And then Hagope got a full time job shortly afterwards at Cerritos College, which everybody thinks that Cypress College is Cerritos right. College. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, now, so the reason I find this so insulting is because I'm sure nobody says to Hagope, oh, you teach at Cyprus, right? They can, they think, like, no, Cerritos no, never gets mixed. that rap. It's mixed. It's both ways. I have plenty of friends that are like, you're at Cyprus, right? I'm like, no, oh, they're really? down there. Oh. They're all white kids. We have better kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so that I, that, I never hear that side of it. I only hear our side. No, of it. no, it's, it's mixed. Like, they're confused all the okay. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, Hagop, tell us a little bit. Um, I mean, maybe if you can start off just by describing your work and um, maybe your background as well. Yeah, well, it's kind of, I, I thought about that for today because actually recently I, I reacquired a painting I did in 1986, which I'll show you um, in the hope of saying how everything kind of cycles back to who we are. Uh, the work that's in the show, and thank you both for including it. I was, you know, grateful for that. They were th these abstract paintings I was making, which were very experimental with pouring paint. And I was, so I grew up relatively traditionally learning to draw and paint the figure. But the early work I did was always very abstracted anyway. Like Picasso and Matisse were my heroes, right? Because of Bob Egan, my community college teacher. Rest in peace, Bob. But um, what I'm saying is I went through the figuration and I realized the freedom of the abstraction was closer to making music, which is something I've been doing most of my life, which, mm. so anyway, um, recently you guys hit a pretty good synthesis. Even the painting behind me is going back to figuration. But I think through the color lessons I learned, you know, I went back and took color theory with Marie Thiebaud at Cal State Long Beach, which kind of opened a whole new door um, in, for my sabbatical. Um, so always big props to Marie and that whole institution. Um, so, you know, recently I found a way to kind of do the experimentation with all the abstraction, uh, the sound, the color, and kind of narrate and bring the figures back in. So, um, I, you know, I think it's an endless, I think all of us as painters, artists, whatever, we, we have that, oh, it's a work, nine to five process. I got to get in there, I got to work, I got to work. So even when I was making abstract paintings, I was making as many, you know, like these, I was making as many as I could just to kind of work out ideas, ideas, composition, color. These are gouache. Um, and then they would actually lead to the bigger ones like this. I mean, this is pretty recent too, actually. And I'm going to show this in a show I've got coming up. It's called Root to Fruit. So it kind of starts with all that organic gestural stuff, but ends up going, you can detail, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, with poured, yeah. layers of, poured layers of paint and tape off and gels and mediums. And, you know, but the thing I realize is even with the gestural mark making, and even that one you can go to has more of a figurative, I think the marks we do inherently are related to how we learn to draw and paint. So the figure was just kind of always there. Since we're looking at that, um, this is pretty funny. I'll bring it over here. So this is, I made this in 1986 at Fullerton College when I, when I was like 19, right? It's a cut paper collage. And again, Bob Egan was great. And he was very experimental and taught me to like do that cut paper, glue it. It's a picnic scene, right? And, but there's so many similarities to the way I use shape and color and composition now, you know, like the guys drinking bubbly, but it was the 1980s, right? These uh, fuchsia colors and um, aqua greens and whatnot were on album covers and clothing. And I seen Paul with clothes that has the same color because he's an 80s guy. So that's kind of going full circle. What's crazy about this is sadly, I live in the same house I was raised in. A whole other story my parents deceased and then um but this was in my sister's best friend julie down the street for like 26 years i i texted her on the blue and said hey i want to get a picture of that and uh she's like it's still here in my bedroom so yeah. she gave it back which was really awesome you know and but you know what i'm saying that so to answer you kind of full circle i started there i'm going through these and then i'm here uh this is a pretty recent one i made called bring light so actually through COVID, it got very depressing, right? Because most of us were just glued to a computer teaching. Like to get into a studio and make creative things felt really tough, like almost gratuitous. So um, this painting kind of came out of that, which you can see, and it is a joyous, full expression. People are dancing. The colors there, the patterns are there. 
Um, you know, and this came. Well, uh, can this have a go? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, you know, um, I've seen your work progress over the years and transform and, and evolve. And you, you hit on this a, a few minutes ago. You just kind of touched on uh, the influence of Marie Thibault and the, you know, the influence that maybe she had when it, turn, when it comes to color. And could you expand on that a little bit more, the importance of color in your work? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, most of us want to use color, but, you know, and Stanley Whitney. I mean, Stanley was so hardcore. Like, he'd really break you down and be like, why are you doing that? You don't need that. You don't need that, you know? Um, yeah. So, I mean, just going back to Marie, of course, Marie's class, I taught with her for years at Cal State from 95 to whatever, 99. So I watched it all going on, and we had a similar class to that when I was an undergrad, but nothing that thorough. So, you know, just like anything, it really dove me into a deeper realm. And now I teach the same class at, Cal at Cerritos College. But, um, but you know, I, it, what it did was, right, so the abstract paintings were actually taking music, like from Bella Bartok or Ornette Coleman, and assigning every instrument a color. So I did have a system which was new for me in terms of assigning color, speed, rhythm, pattern, and, and trying to make a painting based on, you know, the dynamics of a, 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 a song, a musical piece. You know, they are get you, more jazz. They get more jazz. Are you familiar? Hagop, are you familiar with uh, Tim Babington? No. Oh, Modern? Tim. Oh, yeah. No, very, very contemporary. Um, yes. if, if Max is here, he'll, he knows a lot about uh, Tim Babington. He's an English artist that now lives in Las Vegas. And he showed for a long time at Mark Moore Gallery. But he did exactly the same thing. But his paintings look very different. He would take an entire song and assign colors and notes. Uh, so, you know, uh, aligning the, um, uh, aligning the, um, the uh, color wheel, the colors on the color wheel with different notes. Uh, with gotcha. the 12 different notes, and then actually, like, visually creating the song, like, right. in terms of notes. Um, and it, it, in a way, what I'm hearing you say is a lot, like, that influence of music, you know, you're talking about uh, Arnett Coleman, you know, and, and jazz, the, the improv. Is your yeah, work, yeah. The, is your process also improvisational? Yeah, indeed. I think, and even through grad school, what I enjoyed about figure painting then with, was an abstract approach to, they were always changing. The surface was changing. You know, I would start with a very specific composition and then allow the improv of that. I, I probably am a reactionary painter. In other words, I always respond to the surface and how to make the next decision formally. formally. Mm -hmm. But I have a concept when I begin, and I hope that I end up with that same concept, you know, by the end. So if things don't work, I scrap a lot and then come back, try to come back on that same note. You know what I mean? But yeah, you know, when I, I was, there weren't literally songs after a while because I realized it was a shtick, right? We all have these sticks we hang the idea on to make the painting. But in the end, we just want to look at the thing and be enjoyable that we made, right? Um, but the figuration is kind of interesting. I'm by no means a realist. I'm not going to go make paintings that are super tight and rendered. However, like Giotto and... Duccio, and the, when I was in Rome, I studied in Rome, the, those, the clarity of those Renaissance and early Renaissance structures was so awesome and the work put into making these things. So I always have a love for that craft, which again goes to this garage. I call it Factory Najar because we immigrated here in 69 with my father and grandfather always building stuff in this space, right? So when I, I make recordings or I build guitars or paintings, Factory Najar usually goes on the stamp, and it's kind of been cool to foster that whole history here. You know what I mean? So, so are you, Hagop, were you born in Armenia or were you born in the United States? Uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, oh, as okay. some know the history, and we just commemorated the genocide, right? Um, yeah. Uh, most of my grandfather literally survived the genocide, and a lot of those folks uh, escaped to Beirut. Syria, some went to France. So we were the Lebanese faction of that. And there is really a whole dialect and food <laughs> Armenian yeah. that's different from like Yerevan. Traditional Armenia now is a different dialect. But um, yeah, we came here in 69. I mean, but they brought the food, the culture, the whole thing. And again, in my early work, I would narrate that idea of family and history. And it's funny now, you know, I have children, they're in their 20s. And, you know, fortunate to be with Andrea for 30 years. We've 
my children were in the paintings and that family life was in the painting. So, I mean, before I went into the abstraction and uh, I, but I deliberately said, I don't want images. I just want to play with colors. So I know mm -hmm. that's a long answer, but yeah, I'm a uh, Armenian born in Beirut. Uh, yeah, that like, that was what I wasn't clear about whether you came to the United States or whether you were born in the United States. Yeah, and... look, the only tattoo I have is a pilgrimage tattoo. Uh huh. Which means wow. I was the first boy born into the family named after Hagop Sr. So they all went from Beirut to Jerusalem to get, my family all has the same tattoo because it was homage to the newborn. Like the namesake is continuing. <laughs> but wow. genocide, for genocide cultures, this is normal. When my son was born, we tried to tattoo him and all the cops came and it was like, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're doing it in the backyard, of course, but uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, this it's was really... in the church, though. Like, priests priests would do this as alongside of, you know, any ceremony. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah. So you'd get baptized and tattooed at the same tattooed. time. Tattooed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And circumcised if you wanted. But, you know. Wow. <laughs> Kidding. Wow. Right? Interesting. Well, you know, it's really funny because I think of you, Hagop, as being, like, I think of you as being so Californian, you know, like, so Southern Californian. I'm really? not from Southern. Yeah, I'm not from Southern California, so I see this other, I oh. see from a, in a slightly different light, as, and, and we're exactly the same age, so I yeah. think of you as being, like, very, very, like, so much uh, SoCal, but at the same time, I see you as being very, like, having this background of, you know, Armenian descent, and how that kind of yeah. influences you as well, well you know, and, and how those kind of fuse together. No, I was just telling my kids at dinner, I think, I mean, I always still feel like an immigrant, though, you know, because... First of all, no one knew what an Armenian was in the 60s, 70s when we got here. Now Glendale is, of course, Little Armenia and yeah. Hollywood. Um, yeah, it's a trip because, you know, I was always that foreign kid who had like Felafil and, you know, Sarma sandwiches at school. And everyone's like, what is that? And you're like, and then, no, believe me, I had the trappings of foreign guy. Like I had clothes my uncle would make and I'd have to wear to school. <laughs> you know? But you know what? Well, I think what you're talking about is in at 13, we both experienced the most pivotal thing, right? Punk mm -hmm. rock. So Absolutely. The, yeah. The freedom of punk rock and skateboarding to me did that. And then pick up a guitar and play, you know, and learn yeah. that. And, and so the accordion you keep talking about is pr true. That was my roots, but um, it taught me to play guitar. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. That was like a coming of age for us. Um, yeah, yeah, again, I grew up I, at a great time, you know. And absolutely, I. But I'm I'm looking at it a little bit differently because I'm looking at it from the Midwest, and yeah. I'm looking to Los Angeles where you were, and right. you know, like, oh my God, I wish I was there. I, you know, like that's what I wanted, and yeah. so that was where I was on the outside looking in and kind of admiring the culture in Southern California and you know, following all of it, you know, like, but only, of course, we didn't have video at the time even. So it was all through like fanzines, fanzines. you know, records, yeah. fanzines. And so we're looking at it differently than kids would look at it now. And, um, and again, admiring this culture. But it's funny, because like I said, I see all of this so much in your work. You know, yeah. I mean, I see all these little things in your work, um, including the narratives too. You know, you're talking about the importance of family. Of course, that goes back to your Armenian roots, you right. know, um, and then also the influence of color, because I think color is part of I also see this as your um, your aesthetic as being very, very Southern Californian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. you know, like you, that influence of color. And, and again, um, you know, w that I see so many artists being uh, influenced by Marie Thibault as well mm -hmm. in that, you know, so I, I see him as kind of like yeah. in our, our area, there's so many artists that I can think of just offhand who, um, you know, her influence of color comes out in your work so much. Yeah. Um, so I, all those things, you know, all, all great things. And, well, and um, that's, but that's the great part. I mean, the color is an awesome thing to personally investigate, but the structure, like how you organize it and to what degree, you know, percentage of loud color, quiet colors and all that. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I paint like I talk, right? So a lot of the colors are loud, and I'm I'm always trying to kind of make a gray painting or a different. Even when I was on the East Coast for Tyler, like the kids, my colleagues would come in the room, and be like, "What? What's with you, man? It's gray and snowy outside," you know. But uh, yeah. you are who you are, you know. I mean, and even yeah. in history, 
the cultural thing you're talking about, that made me who I am. That's what my paintings become. And, you know, at 55, you sort of start getting settled in your own skin and not worrying about <laughs> all the things you're supposed to do, right? But um, You can just do them. Yeah, you yeah. You just do I them mean, instead of worrying about them. And that's, I think, really um, a, a, great, a great place to be. You know, like, I, I wouldn't want to be 35 again. Well, but I, I think going back <laughs> no, to no offense, maybe more Nicole, relevant topics, but, you know. <laughs> but going back to, yeah, I know I saw you at 35. And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I think going back to the show and your idea of L.A. stories, you really brought, like, a huge, you know, cross-section of what is going on in L.A., right? And mm -hmm. I serve a niche. Andrea serves a niche. Greg and Siobhan serve a niche. You know, everyone serves a niche, but... Um, it's funny, I mean, like I'm saying, these are transitions, like the work in that show is definitely from a period, it, will I go back to doing that? Maybe, probably, yeah. but um, right now I've found a good eclipse of, uh, again, I think imagery and abstraction and song and color, because again, mm -hmm. going back to COVID, the only thing I could do during COVID was record music, because, um, which, come with me, let's go into the laboratory. No, uh, <laughs> well, I think the viewers would be interested, you know, when Andrew and I remodeled the house a while back, we made this into what used to be storage for paintings, but now is a recording studio. So wh when I'm not out mm -hmm. there, I'm in here, you know? Yeah. And it's been such a relief, which is sometimes, even when teaching, you can't come home from teaching and talking about paintings and go paint. You got to come in here and make music, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I've been blessed well, that I have both spaces. And um, anyway. Well, you know what? Um, it's, it's funny because one of the things when I was curating the show is I felt like I didn't even come close to really grasping right. all of the artists that I would, would have really liked to have included. You know, I, what right. I found were like, these are the core ones from my point of view, but man, I felt like I left so many out. Um, but, you know, you have to draw the line somewhere. We only have so much space to do. Oh, this. yeah. I mean, you know, so. All... Yeah, no, I was trying to huge, get like the core, you know. You had a huge feat, but again, all those people are pissed, so you got to answer to that. So, <laughs> I <laughs> say I do my best, you know. <laughs> no, no, anytime we curate shows, I mean, it's impossible to get that full, exactly, you know. So, um, but speaking of which, you know, you're talking about all the different sensibilities of artists here in Los Angeles, and um, your your studio mate has a, a to, from <laughs> what I see, a very different sensibility to oh, you, you know, yeah. um, which I find really interesting, that dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. between you and Andrea, fascinating. And um, maybe this is a good way to transition yeah. into talking about Andrea's work as Absolutely. well. So maybe and, and it's, Pagofi, you can become the cameraman. Yeah, no, no. I, well, and you'll see, you'll see we have to go outside before we can get to mine. So I feel like that's a vote for, oh, there's the cat. I, I really uh, touched a nerve. <laughs> yeah. no, Sep no, no. Separate yeah, spaces. We don't, in, we don't share the same space, damn it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm they kidding. don't share um, the same space. Okay. No, well, but I, as we're I transitioning, to the, I just Hagopa, sorry, I, said, I wanna let you Hagopa, I wanna let you know as we're transitioning, there have been a lot of folks talking to you in the comments just oh. saying hello, that you're an amazing teacher, that they love your work. Oh, so no. um, I think you've got uh, a lot of fans and well, I, friends and students, it looks like, who are watching. Mm -hmm. So they've well, really that's, been enjoying that, it. That's the beauty of Venmo. I sent them all six, six dollars <laughs> and said, please come on at 11 and say something nice. <laughs> well, oh, your six dollars was well spent. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nicole. And thank you all. Those, those that are watching, thanks so much. And you know, I love you all. I know even the students, they're amazing. They, uh, they really take off with all this stuff. So all we do is like Absolutely. the fuse. Anyway, now we're focusing on Andrea Bersaglieri. Oh, thank you for the correction. Um, yeah. Hi, Andrea. Hi, how are you? It's I'm weird great. being this side all of a sudden. I'm much more comfortable <laughs> on the other side, but that's yeah. okay. Um, you um, know, I was thinking about, I was just thinking about something you guys said towards the end there about, you know, you have to get to a certain, almost a certain... I don't know if it's an age or uh, years of service or whatever before you feel comfortable um, doing what you actually want to do as opposed to what you've been trained to do as an artist. And so um, I feel like that's reflected in my work. That's like a through line, I think, probably between all artists that managed to stay at it for a long time. 
Well, you know what? When uh, when I was thinking about the show and um, thinking about your work, I mean, besides like the way that it fit in, I was also thinking about the venue at at Braynell University. And one of the things that impressed me so much about their collection, which there's so much to be impressed by, um, including the director. Uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> including including the director, there's so much to be impressed by. But one of the things is their their collection. Part a major part of it is the Audubon series. You know they have that, and you know oh, I, I see. Didn't know that. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons that I thought, oh, Andrea's work is going to fit in perfectly here because there's so many connections between what she's doing and the Audubon collection. So um, well, maybe fact, that would be a good place to talk and to start, you know, our discussion. Yeah, about it. you know, I was thinking about when earlier you were all talking about backgrounds and stuff. I also went to Cal State Long Beach, and that's where Hagop and I met, actually. Um, and I so I went to uh, graduate school there, too. And that was in the 1980s. And the world was a much different place there, just in terms, you know, besides the music, it was a di much different place in terms of art making as well. And I feel like at that time, the focus was more on the product because it was the 80s and people were selling these giant paintings for so much yeah. money. And that's what we were focused on doing. And um, that is the opposite of what I'm doing now, which I feel like is more processed based mm -hmm. and kind of experience based. And that kind of leads back to that kind of, you know, overlap between science and art where you're mm -hmm. investigating and looking and understanding and analyzing. Oh, and then by the way, some art gets popped out at the other end, you know? Yeah. So like the, the art that happened that you get is a product of the investigation versus the goal. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, that might have something to do with, um, you know, our backgrounds in academia as well you know, that we approach art making kind of in that same way as maybe a researcher would. Right. And I do think I teach a lot of beginning level classes. I teach at Cerritos College and also Cal State Long Beach taught at Cyprus for a while, too. And yes, everybody gets Cyprus and Cerritos mixed up. Um, <laughs> and on top uh, of it, but, just because no, Nicole's a, never been here. Oh, I no. just want to because a, Nicole's a, never uh, been here. They're very close geographically we're really close to each other as well yeah but that that Sorry. attitude is a through line because so many of my students are uh, not necessarily art majors that I feel like if I approach mm -hmm. it as um, you know this is this is the way you can think about things this is the way you can plan for things this is the way you can <laughs> investigate things understand things then that's something that's important to a, a future nurse mm -hmm. or a teacher or engineer or whatever they end up doing a welder any anything that a student ends up doing being able to draw and more importantly probably look at the world as a drawer is um i personally think that if everybody could draw the world would be a better place <laughs> <laughs> i i tell my i tell my drawing class that by the way andrea yeah. and and you know what i mean because you're, you're hitting on a subject i think that is like really key to what you're doing too and that's drawing from observation that you're not drawing from photos, but you're drawing from observation, which is, you know, our, that's how we learn is mm -hmm. through observation. And so many, um, uh, I think throughout the, the ages, um, that my, my father, just to go into a story, my father-in-law, uh, my, par pardon me, my former father-in-law was a, um, a physician and he said when he was in college, he had to take botany classes. And in the botany classes, they required drawing. They, like the students had to draw as a way of differentiating and ob observing and differentiating the different species, genre or uh, genus and species of plants. And so by drawing them, you're, you have to make a clear differentiation. And when I look at right. Andrew's work, I think a lot about botany. And I think about, mm -hmm. um, well, you know, the other things that go into that are, which I think physicians are interested in that because of the drugs that come from different plants and that are made, you know, the combinations that are made and differentiating what, you know, what's the difference between this mm -hmm. mushroom and that mushroom, you mm -hmm. know, well, you draw and you observe the differences, right? Because they could be very similar. 
Yeah, well, in fact, that's how I got into making this particular uh, series of work that started about uh, 10 years ago. Um, I'm also an avid gardener, and um, mm -hmm. that actually sustains my creativity a lot when the studio is not um, particularly fruitful, like during childbearing years or um, when we're in the Zoom world of teaching and we're spending too much time <laughs> looking at a computer. But um, I had decided like 10 years ago, I thought it would be hilarious to make a uh, gardening book that was only focused on my particular yard. And I've always been fascinated with, you know, botanical art, Maria Sibelia, Marianne, artists uh, that like, like Audubon, that writing that line between um, science, illustration, and art. And so I, I had inherited a set of watercolors from my mother who had recently passed away and um, decided to start documenting all of the plants that I had in my yard to be part of this book that I was, that I had envisioned. And then I, about a year into the process, the, the, uh, the, I don't even want to say the drought because now we have one every couple of years, but a major drought <laughs> struck and all of the plants that I had died and, you know, all of these other plants were growing. And then I took advantage of that uh, rebate situation where you could pull out everything and put in native stuff and um, they give you some money to cover the costs. And um, if any of you have done that, you know that there's a lot of weeding that gets involved um, when you make that switch. And so I would be out there um, pulling all of these weeds, begrudging the fact that we had no water. And it wasn't long before I could pull out the most hated weed and be like, you know, this thing's actually really beautiful. Maybe I should include these types of things into my uh, my book that I want to make. And, um, and I just became obsessed with the idea of drawing the weed instead of the flower. Who gets to call it a weed? Why is the weed there anyway? Mm -hmm why is it able to survive and the thing that I want to grow isn't, why do I want that to grow and not this, all those, you know, questions. And so um, I started just documenting all of the weeds that I was pulling out of the yard as they were, as they were coming out and, but doing it in a very painterly way. I don't know mm -hmm. if you can see up close with these, they're all painted um, in red first, really. In fact, if you look over here, you can see a painting that's just getting started. I do it all. It's like, a, it goes back to that color thing. You know, if you have some warm colors uh, first, then when you're putting all of the, the color, the observed colors on top, they just happen to look better. So it became almost kind of process based. I go outside, I pick a weed, I come inside and paint it. I go outside and pick a weed, I come inside and paint it. And that just really, really fulfilled me um, as a gardener and an artist because it felt very productive because I was getting so many things done at the same time. And um, all that just kind of uh, expanded. And uh, I, I ended up feeling that, you know, the things that are less um, beautiful traditionally are often things that, mo that are the most beautiful. Like these, this is a series of pomegranates that were eaten out by um, rats that I found. I have a whole big series of these. This is, this is from the same series that the Branau piece is part of, where um, similar, all of the work that I'm doing is from this piece of property, which is also important because I, I am from Northern California. And when I moved to Southern California to go to school, um, and every, and I got stuck here and stayed because I fell in love. Um, <laughs> what a mistake, <laughs> big mistake. <laughs> um, the whole time I'm just like in the back of my mind, I'm being very attitude-y about just the way the place looks, right? Because I think it's, yeah. Northern California is so beautiful and there's so many trees and everything's really fantastic that way. And so I just kind of fought the system the whole time until I started working this way and, um, you know, started, um, you know, just looking closer. It's back to that investigation thing. Looking yeah. closer, you just, it's just as beautiful. You just have to look a lot closer, you know, 
These are all um, drawings of dirt. Wow. Dirt face. And so um, I, and I also really liked, since the work obviously now becomes environmentally conscious because I'm, I'm literally documenting the changes that are happening on this property as the climate changes. The nice dirt one. These are charcoal. I really like these, but people don't like them as much as me. Um, Your comments uh, right now would say otherwise, Andrea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely. See they get a little bit obsessive, right? Which is, which is, you know, who, what artist do you know that doesn't have a little bit of obsession in them? Yeah. These, like, I like these uh, weed bundles too. These are kind of some of the earlier ones. This is one of the first ones where I like pulled out the weed in my front yard and had the big clump of dirt attached. And I was like, oh my God, that is so beautiful. <laughs> and you yeah. like drop the, sh drop the shovel and run in the house and pick up the paint. Um, Whoa. Whoa. Um, discount, discount, check our Etsy. You can get that one for 3000. <laughs> anyway, I, what I was just going to add before I stop talking is um, all of this smaller watercolor work, I really liked it because it was, um, you know, you can make a whole bunch of them and then just shove them in a drawer. You don't have to yeah. like, you, they don't take up any space. They're not toxic. You don't have to worry about breathing fumes, all that kind of stuff. But then I really missed painting, doing a large, just a large painting. And as you can see, my studio is not super big. It's about half the size or maybe two thirds the size of a two car garage. Um, and so I hemmed and hawed for a while about how I was going to be able to do a big painting and um, be able to get it out of the studio afterwards. So I finally was just like, screw it. I'm gonna measure how big my wall is and just order a piece of canvas that big staple it to the wall and go at it and worry, worry about it later. Wow. And so that was like three years ago, I started this painting and I'm still working on it. I think it's getting close to being done, but as you can see, wow. I really like going tight. So now it's just a matter of, you know, deciding to, to stop working on it because it's yeah. been actually been nice during uh, COVID to have something kind of inconsequential where I could just sit on my, look at my cool little stool I just got to work on the bottom parts, um, where you can, you know, lose several hours on a small part of the painting and, you know, deal with all that, but not, it feel, just doesn't feel like there's a lot of pressure, you know? <laughs> oh, hey, Andrea, there's, there's no pressure. <laughs> That's it. That's right. There's so, no I just am There's like no toiling away in here and the work is like filling drawers and corners, but that's, <laughs> that's the end of the story, you know, but I am, I do have a full museum worth of work here. So <laughs> if anybody's ready, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll I, I will I'll say watch. Andrea that, um, We've, we've had a number of people say that they um, really would love for you to make prints of your work so that they can start buying it up. A lot of people Absolutely. in the comments um, really, really admiring um, everything you've shown. So oh, that's, that's really the, nice. Um, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a huge fan of Kim Abelese, and she curated me into a show. I don't know, when I think of, uh, when I say last summer, I actually mean two summers ago because last summer was... Uh, didn't count. It was not existent. <laughs> um, so at some point she curated me into a show, but it was in a public space. It was all, it was when she was uh, showing some of the work she did for the um, with the women firefighters in uh, in Angels National Forest, and um, so she put some of the the weeds in there. But because it was a pub, uh, such a public space, it was in uh, near Alvera Street. She didn't want to put the the real watercolors in, so she offered to make prints of the watercolors, the larger ones, like the the one that's in uh, in your show, or that there's one on the side that Hoggup's looking at right now, um, and I was really, re I was really surprised at how awesome they looked. So yeah. I have thought about that because you know, as painters, you kind of I do printmaking too, like you know, um, etchings and whatnot. But um, the idea of using um, just like What's the fancy word they use? Jaclay prints? Jaclay. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it always seemed kind of like, oh, do I want to do that? And then, so I haven't actually done it, but I'm starting to uh, to change my mind on that. So maybe I'll put that on my summer to do list. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that is the the prints. I think make a lot of sense. Um, doing doing prints of your work make a lot of sense, and you can see how people respond to it. And you know, I mean, again, I think there's that connection. Uh, Audubon comes to me immediately when I think of your work, you know, I mean, not as a knockoff, but like, there's definitely a connection, even though yours are very distinct, you know, um, so I think, I think well, and it's great. funny because I do, yeah, when I, when I get the weed, I want to paint, I, I have a piece of foam core and pins that I stick, I stick it to so I can, it can like be posed and I can paint it. And I did read that that's how he did, he killed all those birds, you know, to paint them and he'd like, kill them and then pin them to a board to, to pose them before he drew them. Yeah. Yeah. They, that, that makes a lot of sense. Don't kill any weeds. Okay. Oh, wait, too late. You already killed the weed. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Whose side do you want, man? Exactly. Oh, well, uh, Audubon is, uh, is uh, on topic. There's this other um, artist. There's a book I came across called America's Other Audubon. And there is, there was a 13-year-old girl, um, and she, um, she decided that uh, the, it was during the time of, um, of Audubon's work, and she decided she wanted to do the same thing with nests. So she made all these lithographs of all the different nests. And then wow. um, after she... Um, she died within a year after teaching herself to draw and how to print. She died of diphtheria and her family was so moved by her mission that they, they learned how to draw and to make prints. And that that's is really what, cool. What a, what a story. Yeah. Really, really intense. And that same kind of, you know, what we've been talking about that obsession with, uh, with just looking right. Yeah. Just look. Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, for, for me, that's such an important core of, of just learning is, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and we can talk about like observing nature, but we can also talk about just observing our lives. You know, right. um, I'm, I'm really obsessed mm -hmm. with observation, yeah. with the whole yeah. notion of observation, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, uh, well, without getting too personal, that's one of the reasons that I, I practice transcendental right. meditation as a way to clear our minds, remove mm -hmm. the emotion so that we can mm -hmm. see things clearly. We see the world mm -hmm. as, um, uh, we see the world as it is, not through filtered through our emotions. Anyway, that's, that's a whole nother topic. But um, yeah. one of the things that we, we um, are, our rules that we've created for ourselves with Nicole and I is that we have to limit this to 45 minutes so, um, and we are like just at the 45 minute mark. And, um, but I want to tell you how, what a, what a joy it has been to see you in Hagop, Andrea, and to see your work and to, and also to have it in LA stories has been, um, such a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Nicole has done such a phenomenal <laughs> job. The artists have done, are, it's, it's such a joy. So I'm absolutely thrilled you guys. <laughs> It, it has been such a privilege and, you know, both of you, your Venmo money was well spent today. Because <laughs> the, the well, Andrea, from... didn't, Andrea didn't pay anyone and they're still writing. So there you go. <laughs> By yeah, the, the way, the artist who does, the, the little girl slash artist awesome mm -hmm. person that did the, the, uh, that started the nest is Genevieve Jones. Genevieve, Genevieve Jones. Jones. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just I just looked that up because someone asked, so I put that in the comment for anybody who's interested. Genevieve oh, good, Jones. thank you. Um, it, it's just amazing. I feel like I've learned so much from both of you um, today, and it's well, been sort of the joy of this the joy of this series is well, um, getting thank to just you speak both. With... Excellent job navigating the um, Insta Live. Yeah, I know they're crazy. First, this is our first <laughs> one. It's kind of fun. And no, <laughs> thank you both. You're making it so relevant. I know a lot of students and folks that always wonder so this is like a really great introduction to that and absolutely and i see some east coast friends came in too so thank you very much y'all for joining and um, yeah you, you and had some week. hellos from new york yeah yeah 
and I, before we sign off, I want to say that next week mm -hmm. we have Greg Rose and Siobhan McClure. Who, Yay, uh, another power couple. You! Yeah, who we absolutely Siobhan love. Blue. Yeah. And we're thrilled to have those two mm -hmm. um, as well. And then the last, I can't believe that we're coming to the end of this. because I can't got, either. Right? Yeah. It just, seems like we're just, just getting more. started. Yeah. Yeah. And, Excellent uh, job, so, guys. The, the momentum's been great. It's been wonderful seeing you guys, you know, through this whole thing. It's awesome. Well, thank you to Fum Paul. Fumbling Paul around with the money. Yeah, yeah, Paul. This was his brainchild. He and, he convinced me I could handle Instagram Live. So I think, right. um, <laughs> well, I think it's been great. To all my students that asked, how did you end up in a show in Georgia? This gentleman <laughs> organized yeah. everything, loaded more than one truck probably, got his wife, Janice, yay Janice, to carpool with him, go across the state and country and deliver. So it's, it's not incredible. an easy feat, Paul. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I, All right. I, you know, I don't, for me, I don't care about money. The only thing I care about is what am I going to learn from this experience? <laughs> and yeah. so being able to do this, I've learned so much from putting this together and working with everybody, you know, as the curator, I'm kind of the go-between between between everybody. And um, yeah. but it's, it's been fun, it's been challenging. And um, because of that, I get, I feel like I'm the richest person in the world because I get such, so much out of this experience. <laughs> so I'm thrilled for it. Indeed, you know? indeed Absolutely. you are, you are wealthy. So. Well, thank Absolutely. you, Paul. Nicole, Nicole great to connect so and see you in person. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, not nice just an email, the, so yeah, thank you. Nice to put the faces <laughs> to the names and yeah, the pieces. Yeah. Um, it's, right. it's been a tremendous year, more than a year yeah. now of having the show yeah. and, and yeah. people getting to enjoy it. So Oh, and um, I loved the one, one of the, uh, I guess I think it was with Gary and Aline and you were in the gallery and you were talking mm -hmm. about how they were using the gallery for shots. Yes. Oh, COVID nice. shots. I just yes. thought it was awesome. I just so, loved that whole I, um, <laughs> I had to email the nurses, the, the head of our um, health services who were doing the vaccines and say, it's actually time for the show to start coming down and we're packing it up and it's time for it to go back to LA. And they said, you can't, you can't take our art. This is our art. Like, you left it. <laughs> and they all have their favorite pieces. They've all spent oh, so wow. much time enjoying it. And um, so, so many people have gotten to see it despite the crazy scenario of this year. So it's, it's really yeah. indeed. Uh, yeah. Well, really that amazing. too, you know, it's, uh, it's yeah. awesome. We sustained through all that and you guys provided mm -hmm. this. So awesome. Yeah. All it's, right. Not, How not, do we not, not only have we been resilient, but we've also been able to create a lot throughout this experience and, and make mm -hmm. a really, turn a really bad situation into a great situation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Keeping art alive. We have sure. so That's many all you can do. skills. <laughs> Yay, Paul, do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, you All guys, right. thanks, thanks right. so much. Well, thank you, and, thank uh, you, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for, for watching. Yeah, thanks yes. to all the viewers. Really, we appreciate it. Very, same very time, much. same thank place you. next week and the following week, everybody. Yeah, yeah. everyone yeah. else, join next week again and see uh, Siobhan and Greg. You won't be disappointed. It'll, it'll be funner than ours. I mean, really. Okay. <laughs> I think Greg plays accordion or something. All right. Oh, <laughs> we'll have to ask him about that. <laughs> all right, you guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining.